In today's episode, Alex and I expose ourselves for how much time we spend on our phones. We also talk about why Athlean X is wrong and why you should fire your asshole coach. We'll catch you guys on the inside, but don't forget to like and subscribe. So Sundays, we try to take off most of the time, or we want to take off all of the time. And this Sunday, we actually did something really fun together. You were teaching me how to solve a Rubik's Cube. <laughs> yeah. And I'm, you know, pretty good when someone's telling me exactly what to do. I'm really <laughs> good at figuring something out. I So with the Rubik's Cube, my great-grandmother was goaded within her Rubik's Cube and was obsessed with it until she passed away in her 90s. And I enjoyed it when I was in my early teens or I guess like seven, eight years old probably. And I had picked it up and I picked it back up maybe two weeks ago and went through multiple YouTube videos. And fun fact, the first YouTube video <laughs> that I clicked on that has a million plus views, I think, um, was a horrible video and was <laughs> actually teaching me wrong on how to do it. And I had misread the first comment that I read initially when I opened the video, think it was, it was someone being extremely sarcastic and like, it, I, I'll, I'm paraphrasing, but it was like, thanks so much. This helped me so much in the process of, of solving the Rubik's cube. So I was like, great, this one's perfect. And I watched that video so many times over like a three day span and I could not solve it. It kept, I just kept going in circles basically. And it was so frustrating. And then I really actually read the comments and they were all making fun of it and saying it was the worst video ever. And so then I found another video and I solved it pretty quickly. <laughs> yeah. He was watching the video and doing it and he was like, I just can't get this right, but this is like the best video. All the comments are saying like, this is the one to solve a Rubik's cube. And then like the next day he was like, so the comments were actually saying that it was the worst. I just misread that. <laughs> right. And now I'm solving them consistently with, you know, ease. Yeah. Pr like probably, I mean, definitely less than five minutes. The one you did yesterday, it was like bang, bang. Yeah. It depends on how scrambled it is. But I, I would say like three to five minutes is where I'm at right now. I would like to get to under a minute uh, would, is my current goal at the moment. So I'll be there end of the week. Yeah. I, I don't doubt that at all. That's how your brain works. But I'm struggling with, I haven't watched any videos. I've just had Alex like walk me through it, which has been definitely helpful as a whole. But I haven't spent like a ton of time practicing outside of like the few hours we spent on Sunday. And the thing that well, first, I didn't know with Rubik's Cubes that like there's a cadence that you follow. I thought it was just like you get all the colors on one side. And so that really helped to know that there is a cadence. But the cadence, it's like use your right hand clockwise, then counterclockwise, then counterclockwise okay, and clockwise. And the thing that's so difficult is like I know what way is clockwise and counterclockwise? Like, I'm not an idiot. But it had me feeling like I was the dumbest person alive because it's like turning of like you're doing one side and then you're doing the top. And so I'm like, okay, clockwise. And then I'm like, okay, what's the clockwise if I'm at the top of this? Okay, what's clockwise if I'm using my left hand? And I got real thrown off. It can be confusing. Still thrown off about which way is which. <laughs> It will come to you. Practice, 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 practice. Practice, young Kimosabi. Yes. <laughs> well, we are going to get into a Q&A here. So um, how do you stay present in the moment? I know one of your favorite quotes has something to do about be where your feet are or be where your feet are planted. So how do you stay present in the moment? I think that it is easy to get caught up in and focusing on small details and finding yourself hyper fixated and anxious on different things that are happening in your life. And if you take the opportunity to take some deep breaths and zoom out and look at things from a more step back view or, or worldly view, if you will, I think that that allows for me to be more present in the moment and not allowing that hyper fixation to come to fruition. Um, because I think that the biggest theft for me from being present is hyperfixation on things that are potentially going to happen or that have happened and I'm dwelling on them. 
And so allowing for myself to zoom out is the big thing that is, is helpful for me. Well, let's even use this, this podcast as an example of we have a lot of other things to accomplish and we have a lot of moving parts going on right now, but we, we have to be present in this podcast. We can't just be sitting here thinking about everything else that needs to be done, but how do you get your brain to zoom out and really focus on that? So in that context, I think that the biggest thing to realize is that my best day will be in part to being present or, or having a, a quality conversation within this podcast. And I realize that as a whole. And so if I am always coming back to what my core meaning or what my core goal is for the day of, of having a good day and, and feeling accomplished and, and doing things um, specific to my to-do list and those different factors, if that's what my core goal is, then I need to be present here today. And so maybe coming back to what the uh, the goal is or, or what my intent is for um, specific conversations or uh, specific situations as a whole, I would say that that's maybe the the way to go about it of having a core purpose or a core goal that you're adhering to from a day-to-day -day perspective? Yeah, I think it takes practice for sure of like going through the process and trying to take the the emotions out of it temporarily. It's not that to be present that you can't have emotions, but to be able to truly focus on one thing, you have to be able to pull some of the emotions out of it and look at the data and be honest with yourself and make a decision about what needs to be done. And one thing that you have taught me a lot, and especially within how much we've filmed and done podcasts and some really hard situations and hard days is you remind me just like one of my favorite quotes from um, Bill Belichick of do your job of you just are like there's a job to be done and we can't take everything else from the day into it and there have been times that we filmed YouTube videos and we have both been in not the best place or just in in a weird headspace, whatever it may be. And you've shown me of just what it looks like to show up and do it and deal with everything else going on at another time, but we're there to do a job and we have to be able to take, take that situation, pull back, do the job, and then of course circle back around to whatever the root of it is, but being able to just get in there and do your job. The power of compartmentalization. Mm -hmm. I think that compartmentalizing is something that was actually a negative for me growing up because I was able to compartmentalize, but it was me burying emotions and how I felt and, and suppressing my own feelings and those things for people pleasing and those things. But now I'm able to use that same tool in a much different way and being able to use it as more of a research resource rather than a detriment and being able to compartmentalize that I am here in this moment and this is all that I'm focusing on. I've got other things going on. I've got other things that have happened today or, or that I've uh, coming up and those factors, but right now I'm right here. And that's the thing that I try to, to drive home with myself at all times because the the worst thing is that you find yourself and your mind is is fleeting and you're you're in a, an important moment right then. And then now, because your mind was fleeting, you're in a situation where now this particular moment is also shot because you're not focusing and this is submaximal, whatever's being done. And then now you still have this stuff that you were worrying about to deal with. So it's like a, a double negative there and you're just continuing to hinder yourself. And I think that like with, all things, you have to get fed up with your own BS enough to make the change, to make yourself be in a situation where you can zoom out because you can listen to these different podcasts and you can listen to different YouTube videos and give all the tips and tricks. But until you really want to see that change and you're not willing to just continue to give yourself a way out or to give yourself excuses throughout whatever the situation is, you're not going to change. And so that's the, the thing for me is that I just realized that I truly wanted to be better about it. I wanted to be more present. And so I made a very, very diligent effort to be better and to find ways for me to um, improve on these different aspects. Now, this is just my own question for 
to learn more about your brain because I find your brain just very interesting of when you compartmentalize, do you have like buckets that you like visualize in your head that you go into or is it just kind of because you've done it for so long that it looks different than that? I would say I have filing cabinets. I think that I have like my brain feels like a person just running up and down the the middle hallway and I have a bunch of filing cabinets on the sides and my little guy is just running around opening files and getting into the right things and those different factors. And so, you know, with my ADHD as a whole is one thing is that without my medication, that little dude is just running and opening files and just like opening them up and then flinging them in the oh, air man. and then open another cabinet and <laughs> flinging them in the air. And they're all just kind of floating and we're all just kind of grabbing them as they come down. <laughs> and so that's one thing that's helped. My medication has helped tremendously. Um, but the other thing is, is that I also from a, like how my brain works, I am, it's all pictures. And that's the, I guess kind of the unique aspect of my mind is that as I am going through my day and conversation and, and you're speaking to me, it's creating images in my mind of, of what's happening. And so those images or videos just kind of get stored away into those files. And I have to, it's, it's so helpful for me to uh, get those pictures created so that I can have better, I can remember things significantly easier when that's the case. I would love to just be able to see just inside your brain this this filing system as a whole. <laughs> I would really appreciate that. But I would say for myself when it comes to compartmentalizing, a lot of it has come from like things in my real life of being able to have association with different apps or different forms of communication to be able to have that compartmentalization. So I know that if you are slacking me, you're slacking me as a business partner. You're slacking me something when it comes to PD. And I know if you're texting me, yeah, we can talk business via text, but it's normally to. personal that you're you're texting me. And I know that it can be, that's what you're talking to me. That's the hat that you have on. Um, and I know that when I talk to people during, via email, then that's one way. And being able to have, okay, during um, like Instagram DMs are like a different metric for me. So I kind of divide it all up based on where my head needs to be for that situation, which has been helpful of just having those actual separations and associations uh, that allow me to have that compartmentalization. But always working on it, of course, I feel like always a work in progress. Yeah. And, and I think that it's also environment related as well. Like in, in with us working from home, I think that you have to have the environment change to specific things and having specific areas uh, to your best ability, right? Because we've uh, lived the life of being in an apartment where my office was my bedroom. I slept in my bedroom. I ate in my bedroom. Like it was just what it was. And so that wasn't the best scenario. And I wasn't in a good headspace during that time either. Yeah. It was kind of just a grind away and, and make make it work phase of my life. And now I'm in a place where I'm able to have the uh, different areas. And I use that to my advantage because it does help with my mental clarity and those different factors. A hundred percent. So uh, if you were going through a reverse with a client, is there a certain amount of fat you should stop at and then continue with carbs? Or is it more client dependent? I would say that is client dependent. I think that with fats, the we will say following a extended dieting phase, um, if we're looking at a contest prep even more so, did we lose menstrual cycle when we're looking at a female? If the menstrual cycle was lost, getting calories up and into closer to maintenance is our number one priority. So total calories is our big goal. But if we can bias a little bit of, of fats, it's going to be advantageous from carrying out those sex hormones and having better production um, with the hormones as a whole. And so I will get to a good threshold from a fat standpoint. And, and I don't think that there has to be a specific number. Let's say that we got it down to 40 or 35 or something along those lines, getting it back up into the fifties, maybe touching 60 as quickly as possible is a, a good idea. And then carbohydrates are going to be more so dependent on energy demands and those different factors and um, how the individual is responding to training and, and those things. I think that one thing that has changed for me 
over the years is that I've gotten a little bit more aggressive in the reverse diet and I'm not as methodical as I once was. I used to um, really draw out the reverse diet with the hope of the individual maintaining overall leanness. But I think that you sacrifice the likelihood of great adherence. I think that there are individuals who can do it, who can have a extended reverse diet and minimize fat gain and, and have tremendous adherence throughout it. But I would say for the greater majority of individuals at the end of a 16, 20, 24 week deficit, it's going to be better for them to try and, and get back to maintenance within those first four weeks following the diet, if possible, and getting maybe a little bit of extra fat gain that they may have been able to um, get not have if they would have given themselves more time. But I think that when we look at it from a uh, perspective of just maximizing overall adherence, that's going to be the number one thing because you can put a plan into place, but if the plan's being followed 50% of the time, it's kind of null and void. So it's more important that we have the adherence as well as not having the adherence, you're really affecting mental health because you're in a position where the individual is really beating themselves up with negative self-talk and they may be nervous to share that with the coach because it's like you make one mistake, it's probably easier to share that with the coach. You make that second mistake, you're a little bit more weary to to share it because it's like, damn, I, I've already made a mistake and I... I already vocalized it. I don't know if I want to say it again. And then you make that third mistake. Now we're getting less and less likely to, to speak up. And now you're in this self-deprecating uh, cycle of just uh, kind of beating yourself up because you're not speaking up, but you're also still making mistakes. And really all that needs to happen is that you just have the conversation. And if your coach is in a place and, and the relationship is in a place where you are able to work together and really construct a game plan that's going to be the most beneficial for you, it's not just a situation where you or getting scolded because you didn't do the right thing. It's more so about, okay, this is what's happened. We can't change this. How can we move forward to put you in the best position possible to be successful? Is that getting more aggressive with bringing calories up more than what we had anticipated? Are you okay with having the greater fat gain potentially? Like, is that something that you're okay with? And coming to a, a common ground where everyone is on the same page and, and we can have a more adherable protocol moving forward. Yeah, I love the way that you phrase that. And there's a few different points that I want to touch on here. But one thing I feel like you do a fantastic job as as a coach is first creating the environment to begin with that someone can speak up about mistakes. And you can speak on that here in a second. Um, if you have any tips for maybe a, a coach or just in general of creating that that safe environment to speak up. But what I'm very interested in is how you speak towards the mistake, but also being able to still hold them accountable moving forward. Because I feel like you have a good balance of being stern and motivating without just being like, hey, it's okay, we'll get them next time. Uh, so how do you go about that? It's a good question. I think that in my approach, the biggest thing is the established relationship beforehand the established understanding of effort being given from both sides, that both individuals feel that they are being poured into by the other individual. So my protocols are being followed and to their best ability, and they're giving their maximal effort on a day-to-day -day basis. Nine times out of 10, right? There's going to be situations that come up, but there's grace, you earn grace. And from their side, they are feeling a sense of effort from me within their check-in responses, within the training that they're receiving, the adjustments, how I'm answering their questions, am I giving quality feedback? And, and then the relationship is built off of that foundation. So the foundation is the most important part. From there, as errors are made, it is something that needs to be recognized and nipped in the butt immediately. It's not something that needs to be like something happens and you kind of just, ah, it's all right. It was just one time. Don't worry about it. It's, it's time to have a conversation right then. And it's time to have a conversation in the sense that you bring it to their attention, that this is not acceptable. This is what, this is the standard. And this is what you have a, a goal in mind. And this is a standard that needs to be kept to attain that goal. If you want to have a different goal, then we can have different expectations, but these are the expectations that are in place for you. And so how can we go about better situating the protocols to have you in alignment? What are the things that need to change? Why did this happen? 
where did things go wrong? Was it that your sleep was off and, and you were behind on your meals? Was it that um, you got way too hungry and, and uh, made poor decisions in terms of selecting the food? Like there are reasons why these things happen. It's not just because I need to do better. It's not because I, um, I suck or anything of that nature. Like there is a definitive reason why these single situations happen. And when we get into those headspace of I suck or I'm not good at this, it's because we've allowed these singular situations to compound time and time again. And we're just continuing to validate that same thought in our own head. And so that's why nipping it in the butt right from the beginning, the first air is really, really important and not just letting it slip by the wayside. And the other thing is that I'm not greeting the mistake with anger there is no reason for me to greet the mistake with anger because the individual is probably already frustrated enough. They've already gone through this process that they're already upset with themselves. There's no reason for me to bring more anger into the situation. It's more beneficial for me to recognize and understand like, yo, this was a mistake, but we need to figure out a plan moving forward. It's not that I am dismissing the air. It's more so that I'm acknowledging and we are creating a better plan moving forward to have success. And so I think that that's where many individuals may go wrong is that they greet that with anger or emotion. It's like that is not a time to, to bring that to the table. It's a time to have compassion and empathy and figure out an answer to better have protocols moving forward. So I think that that's the, the main thing. And also it's important that the individual is hearing my voice. I think that that's another big thing within our check-ins as a whole is that nothing is being misinterpreted of how I'm saying things. Because I'm sure that some of the things that I say verbally through Loom or through voice memos could be misinterpreted if I was just typing them out. Like you could sure. very much so misinterpret how a sentence is, is put together or my emotion behind that by someone's preconceived notions or, or how they're feeling about themselves in that moment. And so I find that to be also really, really helpful that more often than not, I'm either sending a loom or I'm sending a voice memo or I'm getting on a call right away with that person. And I think that that's one thing, you know, following shows that I prioritize abundantly and it is it's honestly draining for me to do that. Like, and what I mean by that is that the the the, the day of the show on on Saturday, and then we're we're traveling back and we're getting back on Sunday. I generally get on those calls Sunday evening. It's a long day for the competitor. It's a long day for the coach on that Saturday. And then I'm waking up on Sunday, reviewing everything and getting the protocol situated so that we can get on that call that Sunday evening. So it's in the competition season, it's a seven day work day for me a lot of the time, which I, again, I, I've said this on the podcast a number of times. I'm not complaining about that. I love what I do. And I know that for the quality of what I'm wanting to provide, this is a necessity. And so with that, that call on Sunday evening, following the show, it gives us an opportunity to review, to speak about how did the post show meal go? How did the morning after the show go? How are you feeling today? Where is our mindset? How, how are you uh, feeling with your placing? And, and what did I feel with our look? And what were some of the things that we could do differently, maybe within your peak? Or what did we do well? And um, having that conversation. So I think that all this kind of comes back to just maximizing the quality of the conversation and understanding that everyone is human and the mistakes are going to be made. And it's not just a situation where you should be perfect. You suck. Yeah. I'm beautifully said. And I think that you, I mean, you mentored me a lot into the coach that I am today. And with that, you showed me that tough love isn't just being like, you need to do better, you suck, you messed up. It's being able to get to the root. And within physique development, we talk a lot about how we show clients the why of why we're changing things, why we're doing things. But we also ask them why, of why did this happen? Can I get to the root of this issue? And let's really figure it out instead of just saying, get better next week and let's go on with it. Because that doesn't really help anyone involved. And so being able to say, I even had a client of she had 
some higher hunger and she ended up eating over her macros and we were talking through it, her sleep was really off. So we talked about how sleep could affect it, but it wasn't just let's get better sleep next week. It was what's going on that's causing sleep to be off so that we truly can fix this and move on. But it's been incredible that you don't greet things with with that anger uh, within a client situation as well as just in general life because exactly what you said of people are already beating themselves up enough Adding more anger to the situation isn't going to solve anything. It isn't going to help. It, it doesn't, like, even if someone's like, oh, I need honesty or I need tough love, being mean or angry isn't tough love or honesty. It is pulling an emotion that doesn't need to be there. And being able to just treat them like human beings adds to that accountability of, oh, I, he really cares. I want to do better because I care too. And we have this thing in common of how much we care. So let's accomplish what needs to be done. And it holds them to that standard that you're talking about of I need to step up if this is what I really care about. If you are a bikini competitor who has competed well at the regional stage or at the national stage and not placed how you wanted, I would love the opportunity to work with you. If you would inquire via the link in the description box, that would be the first step. And from there, we'll get a call scheduled and I look forward to speaking with you. Well, going forward into the next question here, how did you get into bodybuilding? How did I get into bodybuilding? I was obsessed with it from a young age. I loved, I was kind of a, a closet bodybuilder fan. I was obsessed with Jay Cutler. So I would say at the age of 12 or 13, I was getting into it. My grandmother, um, because my parents were reluctant to get me a muscular development magazine subscription, she got one for me. And so it would be shipped to their house. So I had to go over there. It's kind of her bribing me to spend more time with her uh, because I could go over there and get my magazine. And Very on brand. Yeah. And so I would go over there and uh, I would rip out pages of whatever the workouts were in the uh, muscular development magazine and follow those training uh, sessions as a whole every single month and try to follow the dietary intake that some of the massive bodybuilders, I was maybe 140 pounds at the time, <laughs> um, trying to follow Jay Cutler and, and Ronnie Coleman and, and all the, the different bodybuilders at that time, uh, following their uh, diets and trying to put on as much muscle as I could while I was still basically just skin and bone. So that was the origin origination, I suppose, of me getting into, into bodybuilding. And then as I got into college, fast forward a little bit, that was the first competition that I was able to compete in was uh, as I was transitioning from playing college baseball, I was still in season in comp or in prep for that show, which was like a maniac. bonkers. Yeah. Uh, what we would do, and there's some videos on our YouTube channel, if you dig way back, <laughs> that I would have I would have games the day of and then my roommate and I would go and resistance train at the gym in the evening. So we'd have like a double header and then we would go and train in the evening. And uh, it was, as you can imagine, with that level of caloric expenditure, the fat loss component was easy pretty easy throughout <laughs> that process. Um, and it was a, it was a, I was hooked from that first one. I loved it. I enjoyed the process. I enjoyed the, the hard of it all. Um, and was, was hooked from there on out. What, how do you even find like Jay Cutler to become obsessed with it? Like how did the obsession even start? YouTube. I was, obsessed and I still am to this still, day. Favorite. Well, uh, that can be my next question. Actually, yeah. go ahead. I, I was obsessed with his training videos on YouTube. I thought it was so cool to watch. I thought um, just, I mean, he would upload his entire training sessions. They would be 45 minutes, 50 minutes, 60 minute videos that I would just sit and uh, watch for however long. Like, I thought it was the coolest thing ever. So watching those YouTube videos was huge. Did it just pop up because you were watching sports stuff and then you came across it? I'm not sure. I So I, I early on also liked Athlean X. So mm -hmm. I- Athlean X was the trainer for the New York Mets at that time. My favorite player in the major leagues at that time, his name was David Wright. He was the third baseman. He was working directly with the Athlean X guy. And so that was kind of the first introduction to the fitness aspect because I was obsessed with him and I wanted to get better at 
baseball. And so he had a lot of exercises and things that were strengthening my arm, strengthening my hips and those different aspects. And then that kind of took me into the realm of, of bodybuilding. Okay. Interesting. I learned something new today here as well. So I will do my follow-up question of what is your ranking of social media apps? Is what's the, what's podcast? Is that just YouTube too? You can say like a, a Spotify or a pot, like a yeah. podcast app. So I would say YouTube is my number one. I, I use YouTube a ton and I'm always flabbergasted when people tell me they don't use it. When I bet if we could see like watch time, that would over, be embarrassing. Your, over your YouTube. That would be embarrassing. That would be embarrassing. Even on a day, it would be a little bit embarrassing because you just have it in the background. Right. Like you're not just like just watching YouTube all day, but you right. just have YouTube on. Yeah, I, I have YouTube or Spotify on basically all day with just like background music and those different aspects. Or I have like sports stuff playing in the background uh, from YouTube. So I would say YouTube is my number one. Spotify is probably my number two in terms of use. And then number three is is tough. I would say I'm on Instagram the most from like a social app perspective. I'm not saying which ones you're on the most. What are your favorite? Oh, favorite. Okay. So my top two still stay the, the top okay. two. I enjoy Instagram. I I, I enjoy pictures. I enjoy those things, but that's not really what the app is anymore. Um but if I had to pick between TikTok, Instagram, Pinterest, all those, I would say that Instagram's probably my favorite. Um, Twitter? I like Twitter. I, I don't know. I, I don't post a whole lot on Twitter. You though. don't have to post to enjoy it. Yeah. I mean, I get information from there. I think it's. I think people are funny on there. Hilarious. Yeah. Um, so yeah, YouTube, Spotify, still probably Instagram, then Twitter, and then TikTok. You want to hear an interesting fact about me? Sure. In college, my degree was broadcast journalism. One of my teachers, who's my favorite teacher, had asked me what I wanted to be when I grew up. And I was half joking, but half not at all. And I said, I want to be Twitter famous. Because I just thought that you could be so funny on Twitter. I think that if people asked you that right now, you'd still say the same thing. I could, you know. <laughs> I think that it's a worthy thing to shoot for. A goal, a good goal. I think that if Vine was still around, you would have wanted to oh, be famous on that. For sure. You loved Vine. For sure. Yeah. I still quote it to this day. Yeah. I mean, they were roommates. <laughs> I would say that my ranking of social media apps, YouTube now is number one. Thank I you. wasn't, I was still a YouTube watcher before I met you, but you've definitely stepped that up quite a notch. Yeah. Uh, so YouTube, actually, like the whole reason I have this <laughs> iPad <laughs> is basically just to watch YouTube. And I put a poll up on Twitter asking what platform or what uh, medium people watch YouTube on of their phones, like an iPad, their computer, or on the TV. And I'll have to put up the poll results, but it was overwhelming people's phones. Yeah. And I can't even imagine watching YouTube on my phone. That's a lot of people. I feel like every like people are answering email from their phone and everything. Oh, too. I can't even. I would say number one is from my iPad. Number two is from the TV. Then number three would be my desktop. And then my phone. I, I've only ever watched YouTube on my phone if I'm like trying to figure out how to do something of like, how do I change this door on this random thing. I don't know. I'm going to watch this door. Huh? I couldn't think of anything. So I would watch a YouTube video on my phone, but I would not normally. So YouTube's number one. Twitter's probably number two. Then, then Instagram, then TikTok. I like TikTok. The thing is, TikTok hurts my brain sometimes. I get overwhelmed by it. It's something that you can get so stuck in scrolling. And I know that about myself that I just don't even kind of give that as a temptation. But I always enjoy it when I'm on it. There's some really cool things to learn and to find out. What would you say the top five apps on your phone that you use are? Number one is Control 4. <laughs> <laughs> True. Number one is Control 4. Number two is Spotify. Number three is messages. So those are my top three for sure. Number four would be Instagram. Number five would probably be notes. Yeah. I would probably say notes. I would say, I didn't even think to add messages to it. I feel like I answer a lot of texts on my computer. I would say notes is definitely up there. 
Cal- Google Calendar, I use that a lot on my computer and my phone. Instagram is definitely up there. Spider Solitaire is up there for shizzle. You play that a lot. And then probably Twitter. Yeah. The fact that you just lied to yourself and didn't put Control 4 <laughs> into that list is ridiculous. I don't use it as much as you, but I have been using it more recently. Right, I am on it 24-7. Yeah, because you control. All the things in the house. All? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's your job every task you're like can you turn the air can you turn that tv on can you do this i'm like you have the app as well yeah but i don't like to use it <laughs> and i don't like to have my phone that's my thing because i'll just be like can, wait, can you do this i'm like i don't have my phone the hilarious part is like i don't enjoy having my phone either oh but, i know but... but then the op the other option is if i pull your card you're like well i don't have my phone either and so then we just sit and we're like well we can't do anything so i never have my phone exactly <laughs> So if you ever try to reach me, I just don't have my phone, especially if I'm with Alex. I don't bring my phone. I know. (laughs) All right. Do you have any recommendations for someone who doesn't want to give up distance running but wants to build muscle? I do. I think that you have to make a decision on which one is the most important to you. So if you are enjoying running and you want to be the the best at running, that's going to be your number one priority. And so resistance training is going to fall or is going to fall into a secondary priority at that point. And so you're going to maybe have to resistance train maybe less frequently if you're maximizing your training output, but you're still going to be able to resistance train. You still should resistance train if your goal is still running. If you're wanting to get as jacked as possible and have the greatest hypertrophy, then running is going to become a second fiddle to that. And so I think that that's the number one thing to get into an understanding of is that they both can't be the number one priority. They are are conflicting in that sense of like, you're not going to turn into Jay Cutler, but also be able to run ultra marathons. Like that's just not the body type, nor is that really possible to, to happen. And so once you get into that place, now we are seeing what we can recover from. Where is our cardiovascular health? Are we able to sustain a specific amount of running per week? Is that total miles? Is that um, a specific pace that you're setting? What is the goal that you have within the running? Establish that. And then what is the goal that you have within the training? Can those coexist from a recovery standpoint? Are you having any digestive issues? Are you having any issues with your sleep? How are you feeling from an energy standpoint? take inventory of those factors and then reassess. Like if it was it crappy and you can generally tell if it's crappy in the sense of like, this is not doable or is this just crappy because it's a new stimulus? Is it, am I just like muscular, muscularly sore and a little bit of fatigue or are my joints aching and my body is super inflamed and I'm like throbbing? If that's the case, you probably have overdone it a little bit. And so I, I think that not overcomplicating it and just taking it a week at a time and getting incorporated with these different factors and just collecting data is going to be the best way to go about it. But also understanding that if you're wanting to be a lead at something, you're going to have to prioritize it more. If you're good with being like 75% in each or whatever that would end up being, like that's cool too. Yeah. I would say data, understanding the data or having a coach that does understand it because there are so many variables that you're having to take into consideration. And if you're not well-versed in one or both categories, then it's basically going to be a crapshoot of you trying to figure out exactly how to gauge things. And a big part of that data is going to be like your output and your intensity because there's a lot of undulation that happens within the running and the training training if you are doing both and especially long distance running to have that in place to ensure that you truly can recover from it as well as if you have a certain physique goal in place with both of those that you want to be able to reach. Are you wanting to hire the last coach you will ever need? Well, look no further. Physique Development is here to help you. We have a huge emphasis on knowledge and communication and making sure you know how to get yourself in the best position so you never have to hire another coach again. If this sounds great to you, then go ahead and fill out the inquiry link in the show notes or the description box, and we would love to get on a call with you. What are you proud of, Alex? I've spoken about a couple of times on what my grandfather meant to me um, throughout my life. And one of the things when he passed was that I wanted to live a life that he was proud of. 
and I wanted to embody a lot of the characteristics that he had, one of those being extreme patience, extreme patience. I've never seen someone so patient with everyone, as well as such a strong level of compassion and love. And the love that he extended to my grandmother, the love that he extended to myself, my sister, my parents, everyone around him. He was the most loving person. And I wanted to embody those things. I wanted to be that compassionate. I wanted to be that loving. I wanted to be that patient. And and I'm nowhere near where he was, but I'm significantly closer in those categories than I was when he passed. And so I'm very proud of upholding that to myself. That was a decision I made at, at 19 years old. And I have held true to that. And it's still something that's so tremendously important to me. And so I'm proud of the version of myself that's here today. And that that version is just going to continue to improve day in and day out. And um, I have him to thank for that in terms of just the push and the example that he was for me all growing up. And so I am very proud of that. I am extremely proud of that. I you've grown so much as a person over the time that I've I've known you. You've grown as like a business partner, a husband and every other category in between that I could list and I just I know a lot of people say like, "Oh, he would be proud of you of just like anyone who's passed on." But I know like to my core, he would be proud of the reflection that you've taken each step along the way to become the person that you want to be and the person not that he wanted you to be necessarily because I don't think that you can just like cast on to someone like this is who you should be, but the quality and the caliber of person that he would be so proud to say is his grandson. I know that if he were alive today, he would be definitely listening to every podcast, <laughs> watching every YouTube video, telling you how you could have improved <laughs> in something, um, as well as just giving you so much love um, and telling everyone about you. <laughs> you the whole church would know yeah. that you have a YouTube channel and they would all be subscribed. Um, and that true. is really special to think about. He and grandma both, they'd be going yeah. crazy. <laughs> <laughs> That's for dang sure. I would, you kind of hijacked my answer in a different way, um, as I was not going to say as far as um, exactly that, but I was going to say that I am just proud of the person that I am becoming. Uh, it's something that I've talked about it before of just my my sh past struggle with depression and anxiety to the point that it was just crippling. And I, I didn't really like the person that I was like through the end of high school into college. And I felt really lost of who I even wanted to become or what that looked like. And now I can wake up and it just feel so clear of who I want to be and knowing the characteristics and the attitude and the actions of that person and standing up to that each and every day. And of course, there's still things that I can grow and improve and be better at. But overall, I am just so like extraordinarily proud of like showing up as the person I want to become and not shying away from that due to any other circumstance or what someone says, but just having it in my heart of hearts of this is what I want to accomplish. This is the person that I want to be. And I'm going to, to be that person no matter how hard it is <laughs> along the way. That's what I'm fighting for. And I'm really proud of that fight. I will say when we first met, you were making your way out of the strong depression and those different factors. You had taken the initial steps yourself. And I think that we came into each other's life at such a unique time. It couldn't have been better timing for either of us. We had no idea at the moment, but now when we look back, it's kind of a situation where it's like, we met each other at a point where we were both needing to be built up and we were able to build each other up together and work together um, to see a better version of one another. And we were very willing to push each other to be a better version. And we saw so much more in each other than what the individual saw in themselves. Because I know that when we first met, I, I very vividly remember just knowing that there was so much more to you. There was so much more that you had to offer 
to the world, to, to yourself and, and all those different aspects. And it's been really cool to see that come to fruition. There's been moments where there hasn't been a ton of change and then there's been moments of massive growth, right? And so it's kind of like you are, are chipping away and it seems kind of stagnant, if you will. And then there's just this woof. And then it's just kind of back to the stagnant. And then it's kind of these massive ebbs and flows. And we're in a we're in a strong growth phase right now. It's a we're we're navigating through different levels of, of hard and those things. And um I will say over this past year to a year and a half, we've had to lean in, into each other a ton. And that has allowed for us to strengthen our relationship, strengthen our communication, strengthen our own self-belief in ourselves and in one another. Um and has been like I would say in that time frame has been the best version of of me come to fruition because of some of the adversity that we faced and worked through together. Yeah, I I agree. Big time, and even one of these questions is how did we meet, and that might be something to dive in uh, for a story time for okay. another time. Uh, but I know that one thing that we have talked about, and this actually was a question of what are your favorite qualities about Gus and Tucker. But I do want to rephrase it a little bit because I know we've talked about what have each of them taught you of like within their personalities or who they are as dogs, what have you learned from both Gus and Tucker? And just to disclaim, Alex didn't really grow up like a dog person. Uh, he had pets, but like my family, we grew up like dog people. Our dog is our family. We are dog people. So introducing Gus into Alex's life when we first met, he was kind of like, oh my gosh, this is first a huge dog. And second, like I have never really loved a dog like it's family to this degree. Yeah, Gus was the first dog that I've ever loved. Um, wow, Gus, you hear that? <laughs> so what has Gus taught me? Gut, Gus has taught me to be gentle, to be very gentle because he is very reactive to the emotion that's being brought into the environment. If if you're anxious, he's also anxious. If you're angry, he's very he's very cautious, right? Timid, yeah. He's very timid. And so he has taught me to just be a little bit more uh and I don't want to use the word patient because Tucker takes the crown for that one <laughs> times a trillion. I can't even say that Gus has taught me patience because of what Tucker has taught me. Um but I I think that the main thing is, is Gus has taught me to be much more gentle and not be as reactive. Like he's, he has taught me how to be, um, able to zoom out and take a deep breath and how, like, how can we address things? What's a better approach than just kind of flying off the handle? Cause that's, that's how I dealt with emotion when we first got together. And I don't love admitting that, uh, it's not a characteristic that I'm just excited to flaunt or anything of that nature. <laughs> well, it's not one that you hold any longer. No, so. <laughs> yeah. And and like that was part of the environment that I was raised in. And that's how a lot of people around me handled their, their stress. And so that's how I responded to things. And he was kind of the catalyst to me recognizing how that affected other people. Because I think that when it's person to person in those type of situations, it's easy to just focus on yourself and not to the surroundings as much. But he made it very vividly clear to me, like that's just not how you can handle things. Like you have to have a better approach as a whole. And so that's what Gussie's taught me. Tucker, um, <laughs> patience uh. is times a, a trillion. <laughs> Times a trillion, but also the most loving dog ever. Like how to go by the beat of your own drum. Yes, live your. I mean, he and I are very similar in that of just living our own life and and staying in our lane, and that's all we really care about. Type situation. We carry a lot of the same characteristics of how we go about life. Uh, me and that dog. <laughs> um, just don't tear both your ACLs, please. Yeah, I do not want to take no care of no you. No, thank you for that. <laughs> what is uh, what's Gus Gus taught you? Gus has taught me just so much love. I I don't know how many people know this or have been like following me since I got Gus, uh, but I got Gus back in 2015 or 16. I'm not remembering just right off the top of my head. I get confused with his age. 
Uh, he is seven years old, though. I did solidify that. Uh, so I got him. I had wanted a dog. When I went to college, I tried to convince my parents. Our dog had passed away my junior year of high school, and we had gotten two new dogs for um, one was a Mother's Day present for my mom, and then we got Hank later on. So they have two labs, a black and a chocolate lab. And Hank was my dude. And when I went to college, I was like, let me take Hank to college. And my parents were like, absolutely not. And so they would bring the dogs to visit me sometimes. And obviously, whenever I came home, loved being with the dogs. But I really met I'd always had a dog. I really missed not having a dog. And my freshman year, you had to stay in the dorms. And so sophomore year, I was in an apartment. And I came home uh, for Christmas. And I was very bratty that day. And they love to tell that story. I was so hungry after driving home. It was a bad drive. And I just wanted to go eat. I had no idea they had the sweet surprise of this Christmas ham. Um, and my sister was a big part of getting him in my life, but it was just exactly what I needed. And especially with me touching on just what I was struggling with within depression and anxiety and trying to figure out who I was as a person, Gus like helped me out of that, of I, I had to get out of my bed because I had to take care of someone else. And it was just something that brought so much like light and joy to my life and still does. And he's like the ultimate compa companion of he just like follows me around and it's just like the sweetest boy in the whole wide world. Uh, Tucker, again, he, he teaches patience every second of every day. <laughs> um, but he also just teaches like love and joy of he does beat to his own drum and he is going to do what he wants to do and he's going to have so much fun doing it. Uh, he loves everybody. He loves every dog. He just wants to play and live life to the fullest of just, I want to have so much joy, which is the hardest part of this ACL recovery of he's just not able to do all the things he loves to do. He loves to play with Gus. He loves to play tug of war. They love to run through the yard. They love they love to play, and he can't really do that right now. And so any way that I can bring joy into his life of let's go and sit outside for a few hours or let's play with this thing that's going to make you happy uh, is getting me through all of this of just seeing that joy come back into his life uh, as a whole. But they definitely are some some special dogs and besties, which has made it so much more special. I would say the hardest part of the ACL recovery so far is the confusion of both of them. Like us getting onto them for trying to play. And it's like, it's not that that's the bad thing. It's the timing. That's the bad thing, but they don't understand that. And then Tucker, you know, he thinks that he's healed already. Like, I don't even he think he one realized weekend, that, He's all good. Yeah. I don't think he even realized that something happened. I think that he was just <laughs> thinking that it was good to go. He's got a very, very slight limp at this point, but that's the, the, like, he thinks that his back legs are good to go now. And so the confusion is probably the hardest part for me. I wish that we could talk. I wish I could bark and they would get it. <laughs> I just should explain like just not right now. I right. promise. Right. But we're going to go ahead and wrap things up. If you guys ever have questions that you want us to answer, a lot of times we put question boxes on our Instagram so you can always drop in there. But there's also a Google form in the show notes or the description box that you can submit any question or topic you'd like, to, like us to cover. And we would love to be able to go over it and answer some more questions, fitness related or life related are all over the map uh, being able to go through that. So make sure you share this with a friend and you go ahead, like, comment, and subscribe, and we'll catch you in the next one.